ahoj a dobrý den všem. Mé jméno je Tomáš Praverman a budu vás provázet tímto naším Heureka podcastem a moc se na to těším. Víte, že když nedělám podcast, tak vedu Heureka Group, což je největší srovnavač cen nákupní ráce v regionu střední a východní Evropy. Máme asi 23 milionů cookie userů a tak dále a tak dál. Pokud se o tom chcete rozvědět víc, tak mi buď napište, nebo koukněte na heureka.group. No, vy víte, že na začátku mám takový self-promo, ale tenhle podcast natáčíme krátce po novém roce, tak se vám do nového roku chtěla takový dárek, že vás nebudu tímto self výjimečně, výjimečně um, otravovat a opruzovat. Takže to dáme tentokrát bez self-proma na Heureku. Nicméně neodpustím si teda neudělat takový self na podcast, na to už jste taky zvyklí, ale opakování je matka moudrosti, takže pokud, pokud se vám náš podcast líbí, tak ho nezapomeňte ohodnotit, ať už vězdičkama, lajkama, čímkoliv napsat nějakou hezkou recenzi, nebo o něm říct kamarádovi, nebo o něm tweetnout, za cokoliv budu rád. No a pokud máte nějaký feedback, tak mi určitě napište se na LinkedInu, na Twitteru, na Facebooku, samozřejmě na mailu tomas.braverman.cz Tomas. Tak, to bylo krátký self-promíčko. Jo, a ještě jsem chtěl důležitou věc. Máme nový rok, chtěl jsem vám všem popřát vše nejlepší do nového roku. Doufám, že strávíme všichni ten nový rok 2021 poněkud lépe než, než ten předcházející. Všem vám i nám přeju, aby zkrátka ten šílený koronavirus byl co nejdřív vyřešený. Já musím říct, že jsem optimista v tom smyslu, že prostě v dubnu už bude vyřešený tak jako tak, protože částečně budeme provakcinovaný, částečně budeme promořený a doufám prostě, že, že od dubna to bude všechno fajn. A ono jako si pojďme říct, že ten leden, no, březen uteče jako voda, takže se ani neotočíme a, a, a budeme v dubnu a, a na celý koronavirus doufejme, že budeme tak jenom jako vzpomínat a, a brát si z tohoto dobrý. No, tak, to je přání do nového roku a teď uh, I'll switch to English because um, I'm so happy uh, that we have here um, uh, an, well, a Czech-speaking person but a Canadian guy uh, who is Matthew Václav Duras, uh, a charming, a very interesting person and I'm super happy to have him here uh, in our podcast. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, for being our guest, and I'm l- looking forward uh, to this to, to speaking with you. And uh, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Thomas. I, it's a pleasure to be here, also. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. And uh, I welcome you here in, in our beautiful small town of Tetin, Czech Republic. So. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a really beautiful town, by the way. Yeah, I like it very so. much. Um, You are a charming and interesting person, but the story which goes with you is is really nice, and I'm uh, really looking forward to actually uh, getting to know it uh, in detail. Um, you are met you uh, a CEO and a founder of a company called Johnny Service, and uh, I, I'm sure that the listeners know it. And uh, if they don't recall it now, they will recall it for sure <laughs> during during our uh, during our discussion. But so, so CEO and founder of Johnny Service. And a farmer, is that right? That's correct. Yes. That's correct. Um, Matthew, how should I call you? Because your name is Matthew Václav, but I know that the friends also uh, keep calling you Matěj, like yeah. the, the chicken name. What, what, what do you like the most, actually? How do you like the most uh, that people call you? Well, it's, uh, yes, in Canada, my name is Matthew and Václav. And uh, since I've been here, it all of a sudden became Matje. Uh, so I have to say for 25 years now, or over 25 years, my name has slowly changed from Matthew to Matje. The reason mainly being was for the, the time for the Czech people to say Matthew, the TH did a bit of a problem. Yes. So I accepted and I said now, so I, I actually like both. I have no problem with Matje or Matthew. So. But I guess the Czech people used to call you Matthew, right? Yeah, Matthew, Because, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The TH did a, made a bit of a problem, so yeah. I accepted that it's uh, Matje. And I'm happy to have Václav as a second name. It gives me identity that uh, people recognize I do have some Czech roots. So uh, mm. that's also 
I think a bonus, especially for me at the beginning when I started here, was a bonus that they realized I wasn't just a foreigner coming here to live and work, but I actually have Czech roots. So Václav is actually a name you have from your birthday, uh, given given to you by your your, your that's, parents. Right? That's right. That's my second name, my baptismal name, and that uh, was given to my parents when I was baptized. And uh, the Václav actually comes from my great grandfather. So great grandfather, grandfather, and father, and. Uh, So it's a name that's been in our family for many years. I see. Many, how, how many, many generations? generations? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The family trees are around the corner here, but it goes back hundreds of years. So, so many. Václav, Jan are two very typical names in our family. Cool, cool. So, uh, and uh, by the way, how, uh, you've been living in the Czech in the Czech Republic for some time already. How is it actually with your Czech? I know that you understand very well, which is good for me because if I lose my track, <laughs> yeah. I'll say it in Czech. Yeah. But uh, Czech is obviously a very hard language to learn. So, uh, like, how comfortable are you actually with your Czech? Well, I am actually, I am comfortable with my Czech. I, uh, I don't have any problem with understanding. Um, I would say, you know, for me to speak, um, the grammar is still a problem for me. Uh, when I first came here, I went to Prague and I did take a few courses to try and pick up a little bit of language because at home in Canada, my father, he, he came in 51 to Canada or 52 and at the time, He never thought he would need his Czech again, so he actually we never really learned Czech at home in Canada. My mother's American, so uh, in our family of six children, there was no one that spoke uh, Czech other than my father. So, but when I came here in ninety two, ninety nineteen ninety two, I went to to a course and started to study the language. But then I very quickly moved to the countryside here because of the farming, and uh, of course when I moved to Tetin, which is eight hundred people as opposed to Toronto with six million. Uh, there weren't too many English speaking people here. So it forced me not so much to study the language, but to learn how to get get around and speak the language. So uh, I still say my 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 Czech language was I learned it on the farm. So uh, if you want to talk about farming, my vocabulary is very, very widespread in, in Czech. If you want to talk about certain other things, it's not so so wide. But uh, I feel comfortable with my Czech and uh, my my daily life. Uh, you know, business wise with Johnny's service in the farming is, is in check. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's a necessity. So, mm -hmm. it's a necessity. So, so, uh, your father was uh, a Czech, uh, emigrant to Canada, right? That's correct, yeah. And, um, and, uh, he got, um, and he married, Ameri uh, he married an American woman. That's right. He That's married, he, he left the story. He left here in 1951. He managed to get outside of the country up into up into Eastern Germany and then through Germany and then down the story goes through Portugal and then he finally ended up in in Canada and uh, and then a few years later he uh, he uh, met my my mother who's from New York City on the ski hills because my father at the time when he first came to Canada was uh, um, creating a business and also working on the weekends and one of his weekend jobs was teaching skiing so he was in uh, in a place called uh, outside of Montreal, Grey Rocks, and he was a ski instructor there. And then this group of girls from New York City came down, and my mother happened to be one of them, and uh, that's where they met, and that's the story. And then the rest was history. So they they met on skis, and uh, and then they eventually got married in New York, and then they moved to Toronto because that's where my father had his uh, his business that he had started. So, but, but, but met you, you you met your wife as well uh, while skiing, right? That's correct. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's in our family. My sister's also on, really? on the slopes. No. Yeah, it's, a, it's a good place to meet a girl. It's uh, it is during the day and nighttime. So it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> so, so your father um, um, escaped the Czech Republic because of. Uh, The communists, right? They they grabbed his properties at, at, uh, in fifty one already. Yeah, my father was one of six children, um, and he was the youngest of the six. And uh, in 1948, when they started to nationalize a lot of the, the properties, and this farm being one of them, he had studied agriculture, and his dream was to stay here and and run the family farm here. So when they they took that away and, and started in the 1948, they took it away, and then he slowly had some sort of jobs offered to him here, but then he realized the future for him wasn't going to be here anymore. So that's when he, being the youngest, he wasn't married yet. He was 26 years old at the time. So he decided that uh, he would try and escape. And then he, so his brothers and sisters all stayed here because they already had, they'd been married and their commitments here, but he managed to escape. So he was the only one who escaped? He was the only one who escaped, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. And he, uh, first time he ever got back actually to see his mother and his, uh, his family here was in, uh, not until 1972. So you can imagine it was a long, long years. time by himself with very little contact. Of course, there was no mm. internet fax machines back then. So you can yeah. imagine it was a tough, I mean, like a lot of immigrants who did, had to leave the country, it was a difficult time. Hmm. So, uh, so, so he was a ski instructor, but it was just a side job, right? That was a side job where he could meet people and learn to speak English and find a wife and find a wife, <laughs> some girls, <laughs> <laughs> some girls, of course. Um, yeah. And then he started a business with another Czech mate who had also, uh, left and managed to get into Toronto back in those times in the late fifties. Uh, and they started a business which was based on creating hardware for furniture. They were in the furniture business. And that business still runs today. My brother, my oldest brother, John, runs that business. And uh, so very successful business. He started from nothing, um, raised six kids with it. And, uh, and you so. mean like working the, the Canadian woods to the... Um, it was, it was in, in cooperation with other companies who made the hardware for furniture. So you can say today for furniture, you need legs, steel legs. It's, it's, it's hardware. So hinges, I see, handles. I see. Yeah. Kitchen units today, it's all full of that type of hardware. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So that was his business that he had started. You know, his, he studied agriculture. He was an agriculture engineer. Mm. Um, so then, of course, he, agriculture is something that you have in your heart. So he, uh, when he had the chance, he finally uh, was able to, to purchase a farm in Canada and he started to have a hobby farm there. It wasn't his main business, but he was outside of Toronto. So that was our weekend. Getaway was up to the family farm in uh, outside of the city of Toronto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah was... but still, uh, was he like? Um, was he still thinking about coming back to the Czech, Re Czech Republic when it's possible? Was he missing the Czech Republic, or he just you know forgot about that and was living his own life in Canada? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. Um, a lot of people ask me that, and uh, my answer is, you know, honestly, as a child growing up. My father was, first of all, was a very much a family man and my mother too. So it was all about his family, uh, focus on direct family. We we're a big family, three sisters and two brothers, family of six. So, um, he never really talked about the Czech Republic and not in the sense that he didn't talk about his family. Of course, he talked about his, his mother, our grandmother, which we never met or his sisters and brothers because they were six also. Um, but about the farm and what he had here and uh, we really didn't know much about it. Hmm. And I think he intentionally did that because for him, it was also a very, obviously not an easy topic and, uh, hard to digest. And he, yeah. he, uh, his, his goal, he always said when he first came to Toronto or to Canada, he wanted to create himself a new life, you know, in, in the good sense, because his life, what was here mm. was no longer and his life was going to be now in Canada. And he wanted to create himself his life, meaning that he didn't go to Toronto, didn't want to And nothing meant badly by it, but he didn't want to hang out with Czechs people there only. He wanted to meet people, other nationalities. You know, Toronto at that time was full of different nationalities. So he, he wanted to meet other people. He wanted to speak English. He wanted to, you know, create his own life there, you know, because mm -hmm. there are people who went to Toronto and actually there are. This is a big Czech minority in Toronto. Yeah, there, there is. Yeah. There's big communities and, community. yeah. and for the good or the bad, some of them just don't actually even leave that community. They, they eat their Czech meals. They eat their. Czech mm. foods or whatever. They speak Czech and their father didn't speak, speak Czech at all, right? They speak Czech and they drink the Czech beer, which nothing against that. But as my father's was, he wanted to create mm. his own, his own new life. And, uh, so he, um, I he think he, perhaps he was angry with, with, uh, like the, the Czech communistic party that happened, what happened. And, uh, it created some anger in, in himself. Yeah, no, perhaps. it was definitely, there was some anger there and always, uh, uh, Thoughts about it for sure. And, uh, but going back to like how he created his life, I have to say one thing was I always value was one of the, my father gave me lots of great advice. And one of them was when I first came here, I didn't even know I was going to stay here till this day. Um, meaning when I first came in 1992, wasn't a sure thing that I would settle down and have a family here. So, but he said, whatever you do, you come here, you should create your own life too. And he, what he meant by that was because at the time in 1992, there were a lot of expats coming here. 92, 93, 94, 95. So you could have very easily fit into a group of Americans or people from abroad who came to Prague to live and, you know, in this bubble of expats, uh, and not get out and meet Czech people or get a feeling for the Czech life. 
And so that was his first piece of advice to me was that, uh, you know, try and expand your, create your own life here, that mm. you're not just going to be an expat here. Mm. And I'm very happy for that because it's, uh, I do know of some people that actually stayed in Prague and to this day don't speak Czech. And yeah, I think so do I. So do I. It's a, I find that as a, it's a, a mistake, I think. No. It's a. I agree. Škoda, as you would say. In Czech. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but let's let's speak actually about that year, ninety two, ninety three. Ninety two. I would say I was the first time here in ninety one to so called check it out, um, but I only came here for let's say six weeks in the summertime. Um, well, when did the restitution happen? Actually, well, the restitution uh, when they started to talk about it was in nineteen ninety one, but at the at the time, um, as you probably know, the the laws were just being created it was a, a green or how you say an open field you know even for the politicians for the lawyers no one really knew what's going to happen here you know they had ideas so um no legal framework the framework wasn't there so it was a question of of every day things were changing you know for example one law i remember was that um private landowners maximum they were allowed to get back is 50 hectares so we were at one time we were here that was in 1992 already and Is it is it worth to stay here and from the estate to only have fifty fifty hectares? I'm not saying it's a small amount of land, but it's a small amount compared to the estate. Um so and all of a sudden overnight boom it was uh no, you get everything. So all of a sudden you have to change your plan again. And uh so that was in ninety two when the restitution really started and uh it wasn't until um you know, let's say spring of ninety two when um we had a talk you know my father myself my older brother john was here with me too um you know whether we're gonna really go after this or you know let's let's let say it, aloud that it's a restitution of 600 hectares right um it was something like at that. the time it was it's different now the state but uh, at the time um yes and for the imagination of the listeners one hectare is 100 meters times 100 meters right so 600 hectares it's yeah, a yeah bloody yeah. big piece of ground right yeah, it's it's a it's a large a large piece of ground yeah so um um yeah and you know the, what restitution one thing is about how big it is but really what there was at stake was for my father for his in his heart for his family you know the i'm the fifth generation here my children being the sixth already so it was a you know a very touchy thing too you can imagine i didn't know too much about it at the time but but for my father you know for him to say if we can get this back how we're going to do it and you know so um but then for me it was clear that we have to go for it my father was very much for it too we were all for it let's and that we, we hired a lawyer at the time but it came And then my father went back to Canada, and at that time the communication with Canada and Czech Republic was quite difficult. So it became very clear, even for the lawyer, it was difficult. So then that's when my father decided to pack his bag and come and live here with us. And so we spent my brother, myself, and my father in one small room in this house here, because at the time the house was still full of of people living here. And we lived in one small room, five by three or whatever, three of us. And my father, you know, I didn't speak Czech at the time. So my father had to study the laws and study the possibilities. And so day by day, we start to learn more of the process. And uh, you know, thank God it worked out. It took, it's not even all finished. I have to say the restitution yet. There's still some really? open, not a lot, but some okay. open ends still. But the majority, we were able to, thanks to intensity working on it, we were able to, within one year's time, let's say, we were able to, uh, you know, get most of it done. So, so it took a year uh, before you got most, the biggest part of the restitution. I would say I would put it as yeah, a year, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I have to say it's thanks to a lot of people too. You know, my, it was lucky my father, when he left, the family still was well known here. And even in Baron and the, the, the other cities in really? Prague. So, and didn't have a, our family was a well-known family in the sense that it was, they didn't have a problem with us. So when my father started to come back here and started to be interested, a lot of people helped us too. You know, mm. that's what I have to say. There was a lot of, help them. Big help for me, I have to say, uh, morally was my having my two aunts here. I had an aunt Mary and Aunt Swada. The Swada was my twin, the twin sister of my, my father, and Aunt Mary was uh, the older sister. They're the only two ones living at the time. Um, we didn't understand in each other because they spoke only Czech and not only English, but they became my mothers away from home. And uh, so morally, they helped me a lot. That's, uh, you know, they, they fed me a lot, the good Czech meals and uh, i put on about seven, eight kilos within <laughs> one year. So I was well looked after. Yeah. So, so um, 
you uh, or your father, you and your brother spent here that year to get the restitution back, and then your father and your brother decided to come back to Canada. Yeah. Or, like, was he thinking about staying here, or how did you come to the conclusion that you, Matthew, will start uh, looking after the farm and uh, renew it? Because I can imagine that it was in a horrible state, right? Yeah, the the farm at the time when we took you know, we got it back, um, it was being run by the so-called Stutney Statik, which is that this one was Stutney Statik Lokovice, which meant there's Lokovice in that town. There's a big farm there. There's Tetin, um, Konyaprusi, Yarov. There were more farms put together, and it went under one one um, let's say hood, which was uh, Stutney Statik Lokovice. So when we got it back, yeah, we in 1993, the first of January was the first day when we actually took over the so-called the books and the equipment. We had to make a deal about equipment, and and then we from the first of January we, we were officially running the farm. We had employees here, which were employees of the state. So we, uh, my first, I didn't want to have at the time. We had probably 50 employees here on the farm, which I realized right away that's too many because <laughs> we're not going to afford to pay 50 employees. So, but at the same time, there were a lot of local people, and you know, I, I wasn't going to be the one to go out and fire them all right away. So we had to, you know, work through, find out who we really needed, which ones were better, which ones were weaker, and we've over a period of time, we were able to put together a nice team of people um, who started to work for us, and that's the farm. And at the time, the question about who decided to stay here, well, my father always said he's not going to stay here, mm-hmm. and when we when we got it back, he basically said, "Here you go." Put on the table. It's it's in our name again. You run it, but I'm not gonna send lots of money to finance it. You better make sure it somehow basically it it stands on its own. And so uh, that that was that was a a big testing moment for us. How to uh, you know how to build it in a way that uh, it was able because one thing was just to run it, but the next thing when you just looked outside around yourself that at that time. The roofs were falling down. The mm-hmm. facades were down. There was old water system, old electricity, so you get to see the dollars or the check crowns running through. How much it's going to need to, uh, you know, how much you're going to need to invest in that property. So uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I understand it correctly, you actually the the, the reason you set up the business, which is Johnny Service, the reason was that actually actually you needed money for renewing. The farm, right? Which is which is so funny. Like I've never heard of a reason to set up a business. The fact that you need money for renewing a farm, and uh, it's unbelievable that actually you managed to create the business uh, really mm, to a big scale. Yeah, and Johnny Service, as we all discuss it uh, soon, is a is a big and very successful company. Yeah, no, it's um, it was at the time. It was uh, you know, back in uh, so I was ninety three, ninety four. The farm was running and. I wasn't, you know, we were able to pay for the operations, but I knew if we want to get ahead with this place, we need to come up with some way of making more money. And farming for me was back in Canada in my heart. And now with responsibility of having this family estate, I wanted to make sure it was a success. So I was looking for different ideas. And the idea about Johnny Service, yeah, that, that came in uh, back at the early days of 1996. And, uh, Maybe let's say now, Johnny Service, for, for those who don't know, Is a is a rental service for the mobile facil- outdoor facilities like mobile mobile toilets, right? So uh, so people people now can recall it while passing some mobile mobile uh, mobile uh, toilets. There's either Toy Toy, yeah, or it's Johnny. Service. We don't know who they are, of course. But uh, <laughs> Johnny Service, yeah, no Johnny Service. We started as a just so it's clear because I think for all the listeners, um, my goal has always been is toilets are are the number one product for us, but we're trying to create a a company, a brand that does a lot more than just mobile toilets, but mobile toilets were the first product we had. And uh, the reason was because in Canada, it was a business that was already running. We, we had some good contacts there and it was something that I saw really didn't exist here. And so, and it also for me, I had employees on the farm and I figured, you know, the combination of the employees on the farm, if they could look after, help me with the toilet business, it makes good sense. That's where the idea Uh, those those points put them together and said let's and I had great luck with contacting a manufacturer the largest one in the world which is based in the states but also in Canada and they had no one in Europe at the time using their equipment so we were able to make a good contract with them so you were here actually the first on the market along say. with 
Toy Toy also. Toy Toy is, is a German company, yeah. so they, they were coming from Germany with their equipment. So we were, I would say we're the first Czech company. Yeah, in a mobile toilet business. But Toy Toy uh, came uh, in more or less the same year. Uh, they were, I would say, a year and a half ahead of us. Okay. But they were, like I said, from Germany. And yeah. you started in '96, right? In '96, yeah, I started in '96, and uh, in the springtime in '96. So we're actually this year going to be celebrating, if my math is correct, 25 years of our our first uh, first toilet placed on the ground here in Czech Republic. Hmm. So. By the way, I, I, I'm sure you know it, but uh, uh, actually, I think Czech people understand, um, or Czech people actually name these mobile toilets Toy Toy right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Is, but we're, we're, we're slowly changing that, you see, because the, the Johnny, I believe the Johnny has got a name. What's good about Johnny, too, is that it's, which is a little bit by coincidence, but it's a name that, in, no matter what language... Like whether it's Czech or Slovak or Hungarian or uh, German or Austria, wherever we are with our brand, they can say it. So it's that's that's a positive side. And the question why it's Johnny, it's a the answer is is Johnny on the spot is is something that's very common in the United States or in Canada. If someone's at a construction site or at an event, or they I'm going to the Johnny or I'm going on Johnny on the spot. So, um, so it's like an, an English idiom, how to call to take a pee, yeah? Yeah, exactly. I'm going to the Johnny. So I'm going to the Johnny. It was, you know, the, the, that, that time, you know, my decisions were very quick. Actually, my decisions are quite quick now. And I just said, this is, could be a good one. And, uh, so I decided to call it the Johnny service. That's, uh, and we stuck with the name and, and around that now we are building on different products and different services. So, um. That is really cool. I, I like the name. I, I actually, I didn't know uh, that, um, how do you say, to take a journey or to, to, to go on a journey? To go on a journey. Yeah, to, to go on a journey. I didn't know that it, that it means uh, to take a pee. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I got to know it while preparing the podcast and, uh, uh, and I fully, uh, because it was interesting for me to actually, uh, I, I wanted to ask you what was what is the reason how we, why you call the company Johnny Service and and I really like like this the reason yeah, yeah no it's and the, the what's interesting about that is with the the Johnny but then also the service because we like to consider ourselves a service business and so that's helped us a lot now too with the other products that we offer all our other party services and our, so it's actually a service we're doing yeah. uh, it's not only about just the toilet but it's around it the whole complete service and this is where we try and differentiate ourselves from our competition. We we don't want to be just the toilet guys. We are the toilet guys plus lots of other things. And you know the the thing about the, the toilet business, as you I'm sure you can imagine, you know it's not going away. Um, and what's interesting to see how it's over the years progressed from basically nothing here as far as a mobile toilet and now the standards when I compare Czech Republic to Canada Canada standards are still, I would say, behind the level that's demanded here in the Czech Republic. You mean uh, the number of demanded toilets at some events, right? And I would say it's not about the quantity, but the quality of I toilets. See. They're looking for sinks. They're looking for soap dispensers. They're looking for heating. They're looking for not only just a plastic toilet. They want the trailers. They want the containers. You know, They want showers. They want disinfection, of course, now. You know, during the COVID, now it's proved to us that our business is something that only becomes more and more aware to people how important it is. So, um, and so it's, you know, in all the four countries we are right now, I say Czech Republic is on the highest standard level right now, followed by Austria, Slovak, Hungary. So um, I'm happy for that because it's it makes the business for us very interesting. We don't just stick with one product, but we're able to keep on every year adding something on and and uh, creating a higher level product. Yeah. So you have uh, like to name service. it. Uh, I, I checked your uh, websites, and by yeah. the way, it's also worth renewing a little bit. Imagine. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm aware of that. You're not the <laughs> first one to say that, and I have to say it's it's on its way. Well, right? okay. <laughs> we are, I can tell everyone out there listening that we are we are definitely aware of that, but we've been focusing on so well, many the service, the service, <laughs> and so many other things. But I know, and I can promise you by the end of this year, it's. <laughs> it's done. It's gonna be. It's gonna be a big bang. <laughs> Looking forward. No, but so so you're you're renting um, like toilets with basins, toilets, fencings, like like fences, mobile offices, containers, party tents, right? Yeah. That's... What, what are the shares actually? How big part of uh, these 
uh, is toilets and and fences. I guess is a big business too, right? Yeah, the mobile fence is a big business. I would say that we're still. If you want to talk, I wouldn't just say toilets, but if we're going to say about sanitation equipment, meaning the showers and toilets, um, that is still somewhere in the sixty percent of our business, let's say, and the the other forty percent is a breakdown between mobile fences, which means for construction site or for big social events or um, cultural events. And then a big growing part of our business now is our mobile space, which are uh, office uh, containers or storage containers. Mm-hmm. That's a big part of our business, which is, is growing now quite a bit also. Mm-hmm. So those are the three. And then we have the party service around that, which is from tents to tables to podiums to air conditioning to heating to uh, all the things that you need for what we we've created is a is a service where it's a turn the key event you want to throw a wedding we can put a wedding on for you in the middle of a field somewhere because we everything have except for the fiance except for the fiance we can try and keep her there by fencing her in but <laughs> we can yeah. out. and uh, you mentioned actually that you are not only in the Czech Republic but also in Slovakia Austria and Hungary right yeah we're in we're in the four countries so um Uh, we started here in Czech, like I said, in '96, and then our first expansion was in in 2000 to Slovakia, which was a for me a quite a natural place to go. Absolutely. At the time, we had a lot of customers here in Czech, which were interested in using our services there. So we, yeah, it was an easy one, language wise too, not a big change for us. Um, and then the next one followed in 2001, which was uh, was Hungary, and in Hungary it was due to we had a lot of connection with the construction industry there and a lot of developers, so we we decided to. Do our services there, but we there we focused really on construction business. We didn't mm. go into the event business there so much, which we do now. In Slovakia, we do event in construction, long term rentals, meaning for municipalities, for the military, and in the state. Um, and and the then, shares of the countries, the the shares, the, the size of the whole breakdown. Uh, yeah, I mean, how how big part of the business does the Czech Republic do, and, and the other countries? The, the Czech Republic is doing, let's say, seventy percent, seventy five percent of the business mm. still. But uh, we we have uh, Austria, uh, some big plans, uh, because Austria. We it's interesting. People will say, well, "Why would you go to Austria if it already exists?" And actually, what we do doesn't really exist there. Really, this is what we've learned over the the last couple of years. You know, you have the mobile company, mobile toilet company there. You have the fencing guys, or you have the container guys. But you don't have the guy offering the you know the full package, which we do. We see there's great opportunity. So we started in Austria with the event business, and just last year now we started to break off into the construction also. Cool. So um, so you feel there's a big potential and opportunity in Austria? Yeah, I'm excited about Austria. I really. Uh, I'm and really let's excited. let's mention that your wife is Austrian. Of course, yeah. That's yeah. that's another. Uh, let's just be honest the way it is. Yeah, <laughs> I had to go to Austria eventually. So uh, once you once going there, you can do the business as well, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. There's lots of little things benefits about it for sure. Yeah. No, we we um, we I always said we will go to Austria one day, and it it just sort of happened once again. Like I said, my decisions are sometimes just random and quick. And it was two years ago. We said let's just do it, and we found a great guy there who looks after the business for us. And this is the thing I have to mention too: in these countries, to expand to them, it's all about the people too. And I've been very lucky to find, you know, to start with the manager for the country. That's uh, that's number one. And you have some local warehouses uh, where you store it, or do you deliver it from the Czech Republic, or how do you? No, know, we um, we do it all locally. And this is something that we're able to differentiate ourselves from our competition. We we do not do it centralizing. We I, I've over the years learned, which has been fascinating for me, being a Canadian and come to Czech Republic, but a country so small like Czech Republic compared to Canada, I would like to say, just because land mass. Um, but you can go from here to Pilsen, and there's a huge difference between a person from Baron and a person from Pilsen. Or a, when I was single, finding the difference between a girl from Czeski Budjevice or a girl from Ostrava. There's a big difference between them. Oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> and, uh, and all in a good way. All in a good way. I don't want to say one's better than the other. But... Um, So I learned that we need to be a regional operations. We cannot sit here in Prague and say, hey, we know what we're going to do in all of Austria, we're going to do. And so we broke it down into so-called branch offices. So each, we have, for example, here in the Czech Republic, nine different branch offices. So in each so branch Nine office, small warehouses. Yeah, there's storage. warehouses, that's storage of equipment. Yeah. And, but over the years, we build up our, our, our capacities there. And the same, the same setup is throughout Slovakia. Hungary and Austria now. Hmm. How big is the business actually in total? Uh, right now, we'll, we'll be doing in in Czech uh, Czech rounds, two hundred and ninety, three hundred million. That's cool. Yeah, 
and, yes, and, and the profitability of the business, actually? Our goal is always never below 25% EBITDA. Mm -hmm. um, but we do believe we've had years where we've hit 30 and we believe we can still do better than that. And, so you uh, make some hundred million yield EBITDA. We can, we can, uh, you know, it's, we can, we can see it, uh, going and it's based on how we're set it up. It's all about, um, efficiency of the business because it's a logistical business, you know, as a center service. And, and, uh, so yeah, it's, That's not bad, Matthew, considering that you set up this business only to have some money for renewing the farm. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, it's been uh, for us, let's say, um, you know, I, I spend a lot of time with Johnny Service. That uh, still occupies a lot of my time. Uh, even I would like to spend more time with the farming. But I, What is the share, by the way? Uh, the breakdown of time-wise, yeah. I would say uh, somewhere between... Uh, We're still at about 85% of my time is Johnny service. 85? Okay. Yeah. 15% is, is, uh, is, uh, the farming, which is fine. I mean, I love Johnny service. I have to say, I love, I still, I love the business. It's, it's an exciting business. You know, it's, uh, one thing about it too fascinates me is that the spectrum of people that I've met over the years from the construction guys to the event guys, to the rock stars, you know, to the private weddings, to the, the mayors of the different cities, to the military. We have, we do a lot of training with exercising with foreign militaries. You know, the Czech Republic has a lot of these bases where they're allowed to come and, you know, uh, train. So, um, we had the Americans here. We had the Belgians here. So you meet people from all parts of the world and, uh, and you have something that they all really need. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, I love the business. That's, uh, but I love farming, of course, too. But, you know, I, I live here. So of course, my, when I'm here, I, I do, uh, work on the farm or work with the farm. Uh, maybe in the future, I'll have more time for the farming, but time will tell. Uh, I'm happy as it is right now. That's so you like both. I mean, uh, can you say what, what fulfills you more? Uh, what do you would like more to take care of the farm or of Johnny's service? Uh, I have to say what comes with the farm, it comes with my family too. When I'm able to be more on the farm, that means I'm able to be more with my family. So if, if I would say something, yeah, I would like to be a little bit more with my family. Um, but you know, the business now with Johnny's service has changed too, where the traveling isn't needed so much. So I'm, I'm able to spend more time here. So, um, the children are growing up. So they're also getting more and more involved in the farm itself, which just makes it fascinating for me because they start to have more interest asking questions, how we do this, why we do this. And, Uh, so the so farming in its own way is sort of coming more into my life because as the children are growing up mm -hmm. and I'm very lucky to have Veronica, my wife, who, uh, she loves the farming too. You know, she loves her horses and she loves to live here. So that makes it much easier too, of course, that we all enjoy to be here. So before we talk about a farm, which I'm really curious about, uh, last thing about Johnny service, COVID, because Obviously, uh, COVID has affected uh, the events. Uh, there were not many outdoor events uh, happening this year or actually last year. Yeah. Uh, so uh, one would say that you were really badly negatively influenced by COVID. How was it actually? Or yeah. how is it actually? Yeah, no, I, um, with the COVID, we, when it started to, you know, I have to say for last year, for the year 2020, we had some really big plans. It was a, it was um We've probably never been well so well prepared for the year when it comes to purchasing equipment ahead of time and have the right workforce in place. And it was going to be Olympic year. We're, we're partners with the Czech Olympic team. Um, we had a lot of big events lined up, so we were very excited. And you know, but then expecting yeah, high numbers, ex yeah, expecting high numbers, and all of a sudden COVID. And so all of a sudden it was, you know, like all of us, I think we took a couple nights to sleep on it and then to wake up and say, okay, what are we going to do about it? So, and that's what happened. We, you know, and we weren't able to meet as a team, the whole, all the companies, but it was thanks to the, the conference calls and the zoom calls that we started to put our heads together, how we're going to deal with it. Because it was clear to us all of a sudden, this piece of our business is not going to happen this year. It may happen, but if it happens, big piece, uh, at the time it's 40% of 40%. our, 40%, 40% of our, our business is, we call it the short term event business. Hmm. But what had happened is, uh, first of all, the team, everyone came together very strong. And, you know, again, having the branches that we have, we have these managers. So everyone took on the responsibility. First thing we have to do is, is be very careful with our costs. Um, you know, we need to watch our cash flows. 
uh, and we have to protect the business that we have. Did you, did you cut costs? We cut a lot of costs. Yeah. Yeah. We you cut really a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to say that was from the beginning. I said, I don't want to cut the people. I don't want to let employees go. At the time, I was... Uh, and by the end of the year, we did let some people go, but it's a very small amount of people from the team. And um, probably would have let go anyways. So... Yeah. Um, but where we were able to save on costs was, yeah, we had to start to really, you know... Like I said, it's logistics. We have to, we have a lot of trucks on the road. We have a lot of drivers. So we have to really clarify the routes. We have to save the fuel costs. We have to look after the maintenance of the trucks. And we had to protect our business, of course, that we had, which was the long-term business, which was construction, municipalities, you know, the state businesses that we have, the military. And so we really focused to make sure that we kept that business. And what happened, which was very interesting, is that normally in our business in the springtime, we all shoop, hop into the the mode of events, sports events, um, you know, culture events, festivals, and our construction business slowly or our long-term business is kind of left on the back burner, you know, for the summer months to slowly cook. Um, but the, the event business wasn't really going to happen. So we said, listen, okay, we have to go after construction. We have to go after more. We have to want more. And it pushed us more and more, and which was great. And so, again, hat down to the team. They, they we actually... In the long-term business, we saw an increase 15 to 20% in sales this year um, with good business. And the other thing that happened with the COVID was, yeah, there was sinks in demand, disinfection for your hands, railways we were supplying with disinfection, sinks we were putting on construction sites, which never had sinks before. We were putting showers at certain sites. So all our sanitation equipment, which we normally would use for the event business, all of a sudden we were placing in different places cemeteries, you know, for the people visiting. So it was fascinating how, you know, the service we, we have actually found itself another, another role in the, in the, in the, out in the, in the field for us. And mm. uh, so thanks to that. So, uh, you know, overall this year, we look at as a very positive year. We learned a lot. And I think, you know, the important thing for what I say to everyone is that we should not return back to the old way. I'm not saying it was bad, but we should take this opportunity as an opportunity to, to look back what was and how we did it back in 2020. And let's keep implementing better and better, you know, systems so we can keep that profitability because our profitability actually was better in 2020 than in 2019. Really? Yeah. EBITDA. Really? Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So it's uh, a lot that we learned for, you know, this, uh, there's, I think uh, I'm not the only one. A lot of people will say that, you know, there's, a lot of good things that will come out of this. I'm very unfortunate for certain things, of course, but from a business wise, I think we learned a lot. Hmm. That's interesting. That's yeah. cool. Všechno zlé pro něco dobré, like we say in Czech. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. Okay, uh, great. Uh, Matthew, uh, let's talk a while about the farm. Like, uh, what do you actually breed and grow in a farm? I saw, you. I had a chance to see your beautiful black Angus Yeah. Uh, how is it called? Uh, Aberdeen Black Angus. Yeah. Yeah. The, the best beef in the world. <laughs> At least I think so. Yeah. They look wonderful. So what do you actually breathe and grow? On the so farm? Uh, what we do on the farm, we have forestry. You know, uh, most of our forest is part of uh, the Narodni Pshirodni Rezervatsai, which is a national nature reserve. Uh, so it's, it's limited to what we do there. But um, we cut wood there. We cut timber, hardwoods, softwoods, and we send it to the mill. So that's, and then we, of course, we do reforestation and, you know, we look after the forest. The other part of the business is, is cash crops, we say in English, which means you're growing different wheats, barleys, grains, canola, um, and you're selling the crops. So that's that's a big part of our business. We, we do a lot of winter wheat and spring crops, uh, spring barley. Our wheat usually exports, is exported all over Europe. We have different agents who buy it from us and then they sell it abroad. Uh, barley, we try and produce Slavovni uh, Yechman, which is for uh, the Czech people. Uh, yeah. so it's not always, not well, always the most that important easy. product of your farm. Exactly. <laughs> we, we like to support the people. So um, it doesn't always work out because it's a tricky crop, but we do make it. We actually supply it to the local brewery here in, in Baron. And uh, so that's the, the barley. And then we produce canola, which is Zepka. And uh, that's a, a good crop for us also. And we produce feed, of course, for our cattle. We, we like to 
only feed our cattle the feed that we produce. So we grow grasses, alfalfas, corn, all the feed that they need, the grains, we we produce on the farm ourselves, and that's where they get fed. So our, our cattle, are, we know what they're getting fed. It's not We're not using using many chemicals for it, and uh, it's clean feed. So that's that's the fields. And then they have the beef. Um, we run a herd of about 160, 170 head of cattle right now, and they're all Aberdeen Black Angus. Uh, we started, this farm originally was actually a dairy farm, historically. When my father left, it was actually a, at the time when he left in 1948, it was actually on the leading edge of a dairy farm. When when it's they just a dairy, Amlico. Okay. Yeah, Amlico. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but when he left, or when they took it away, of course they didn't invest in anything like all the cases, so it all fell apart. And so when I came here, the dairy system itself was extremely old, and to run it, there was a hundred head of cattle there that were need to be milked every day, and at the time I had eight ladies here, Chesky Babichkis, very nice ladies. Um, and they physically had to milk the cows and, uh, to get the quality and the quantity was very difficult. So the reason I'm talking about this is because that's why I do beef now is because I, so you don't, you don't want to get any, uh, any, any, no, not at one Christmas I went back to Canada to see my friends and, and I also had some good connections at one of the top universities in Canada, agriculture universities. I explained the layout, what I have, and I need to make some changes because I can't have eight employees here milking cows like this and for, for no money. Um, so they recommended we decided to do some crossbreeding with Aberdeen Angus. So I brought from Canada six head of Aberdeen Angus um, to start, and then we slowly built up the, the the breed. I started to build pastures, you know, pasture meaning the cows can be outside, which was very unusual here. I didn't in the area I didn't see any cows outside. Mm. I mean, in Canada, you see them always outside. In Austria, in Austria. <laughs> so I was like, but I was, in Austria, uh, the, the the cows are violet. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it tastes like chocolate, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, so the the pastures was, we decided, because the, 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 the land around Baron, for all you don't know, Baron, the area, it's great land for pastures. It's hills and you grow, the grass grows well. So we started to fence in some lands and then we uh, let the cows loose. And it was a big thing here. It was like a... Um, all of a sudden, there was black cows on the fields here, and people are, what's going on? Oh, they're beautiful, by the way. The cows are really beautiful. Yeah, I like the. That's my, uh, well, one of my favorite birds. It's, it's, it's a black, dark, dark brown or black? Black. Black. There is a red Angus also. That's just, it's the same basically breed, but it's just a different color. It's called so, red, red Angus. Yeah. Red Angus, yeah. It's the and, same. And that's, that's brown, right? And we have the, the, the color of the red. No, it, it's actually. It's, it's really red. It's quite red. It's like a really? rusty red, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. okay. But the other reason I chose the Angus too is that they're. They're, they're great, easy to maintain. They produce great beef. They're easy to, like I said, maintain. They're not aggressive. They're friendly. So, and then we have yeah, produced the beef. And now we, we started uh, two years ago. It's already two years now. Uh, we built uh, our own facilities so we can actually, the cows, they're, they're born here. They're raised here. And the ones that go for meat actually are slaughtered here on the farm. We, we dry hang it. For three to four weeks, we have a butcher everything. here. Everything, yeah, really? yeah. And then the butcher comes, he prepares it all. We package it, and then we actually sell it ourselves now. So we have a farm shop here on the site, and then we also deliver to Prague or in the area. But where, where can I buy it? Actually, you can buy it here on the on the farm. I the will. Farm. <laughs> <laughs> we can maybe try and open it still for you, <laughs> um, or uh, uh, on the internet, and we deliver it. So, and this is the thing about COVID again, what happened with COVID, of course, people didn't want to move around too much. So we decided, you know, to start, you know, so now we have a daily route to Prague and we deliver it throughout the city. And Rohli Koshik, what, what companies do deliver, do, do you supply with? We don't supply with them. We go on our own without them. Really? Yeah. yeah. We have, we have our own driver, our own guy. And, and like, uh, where is it available uh, on the internet? Did it's, you... it's on our farm site. Okay. Which is on Belko Stopek Tatin. Belko Stopek yeah. Tatin sees that, right? Yeah. Okay. You find it there. I hope you like the website there. Uh, I'll tell <laughs> you then. Yeah, yeah, you can check it out. <laughs> But yeah, you can find it there. And, and so now what we decided to do too is because one part is selling steaks and, you know, the ground beef and all that. But we also started to produce our own sausages now. We make beef jerky, which is a big hit. I have to say it's going like hotcakes. And uh, the sausages and smoked meats and... And we have a deer farm, so we actually have Danyek and Yellen, different game that we also sell. 
So that's cool. And uh, so you sell everything on your own, either online or in the store here? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Or we go to markets. That's the other thing, okay. which is actually another thing we have uh, planned. We actually planned for this year, or sorry, last year, 2020, well, the farmer's market. We have here a plan up to the north of, or to the south of the town here. We're going to have, it's called Tetinsky Farmer's Kitari. And uh, the project is based on only local producers in the in the area, the Czech area here, can sell their products there. And uh, so our next, because of the COVID, we had to cancel it for last year. Mm-hmm. But so our date is now for the 20th of March this year, Easter market. So I hope we can uh, we can open up officially our farmer's market. There'll be live music. And program here in Tatin? Yeah, it's just down the road. Really? It's an old farm we have there. Yeah. And it's outside under the trees. We want to have, we have podium there, live music, program for the kids, program for the middle age, old age. We want to make it like a family event, not only to come and buy something, but you come and you spend the morning, you get a nice breakfast there or a nice lunch there. Look so forward, it's, imagine. It's, my my uh, my inspiration came from Canada because that ex- exists in Canada, and in South Africa, I was there a few times, and I saw how they do it there, and it's a great event. So that's our our plan for this year. So you'll you'll be selling on the market. You'll be selling both raw and uh, like um, burgers, burgers, or, yeah, and so on. yeah, sure. Yeah. Warm meals, and yeah. then we have the local breweries coming there. They they serve their local beers, beer tasting. But like I said, for something for everyone, for the kids, for the that's going to be a feast. Yeah, we feast, bloody feast. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it should be a big hit. A lot of people have driven driven by and saw the sign and said, "Wow, what a great idea! Can't wait. When's it going to be? When's it going to yeah, be?" Yeah. Um, and I'm, so we kept up to changing the date last year. We had three dates last year. Kept taking it down next date. <laughs> but this year we're convinced. Twentieth of, uh, of March. Of March. Yeah. If, if it's possible, but hopefully it will be at the I time. Think, I think it should. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's great. And uh, tell me. Um, by the way, the first thing what I'm going to do when I come home is that I'll check out the websites. Yeah, please do that. I'll send you a feedback, and mm-hmm. of course I'll buy some fancy uh, meat, uh, some fancy black Angus meat. I'll make sure I'll organize something special for you. So oh. <laughs> um, how does the farming look uh, financial, actually? Uh, how, how good or bad business is it? Well, the farming, that's a good question. The farming, there's, depends how you want to look at it. If you, if you don't include any of the investments into it, if you just want to take it as a, you know, the day-to-day operations, um, I would say over the years, it's, uh, it has become profitable. It's not a huge profitable business. Um, I have to say we do have the dotations, the, the, the dotaces from the, the government grants, the you know, which the subsidies, sorry, um, which do help us, you know, I'm a bit of a person against it. Uh, cause I think the market should be more of a free market where we should be able to establish the pricing a little bit in a different but way. But if your competitor, if all your competitors get it, then it would be unfair that you don't get it and it would be yeah. hard to, to compete, right? Yeah. No, this is the thing. I mean, what I said is I'm against it by there and I know it's either all or not. You have to fight agrofair. Yeah. No, you have to, it's like all or not. So, you know, when, when the French decide to maybe let the market go more free and the other European countries, then maybe the, it could happen one day, but the way it is now, no, it's, it's, uh, it's set up in a way for, you know, so. And is it Czech or European subsidies? What do you get actually? It's a combination. It's a combination. Yeah. It's always a combination. Um, so. And how yeah. big is it? How big is it in, in the budget of revenues? Oof, yeah. Like percentage. Yeah. Or less. Rough guess. Rough guess. 15. 15%. No, yeah. not, that's not that big. I, 15, I, 20%. I, 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 I suppose it would be higher. Yeah, but please don't take me. Don't want to take me for, <laughs> for a real number. I, you know, the accounting of my farming, I sometimes prefer not always to look into it, you see, because or else you may get a little bit more disappointed, right? So I kind of sometimes close my eyes to certain things because <laughs> I just know I have to do it. So <laughs> I see. And that's, you know, along with the, the other part of it is the investments. Yeah. Because you see the buildings, there's a lot of buildings to look at, a lot of roofs. So there's a way you can look at it. A lot of machinery. A lot of machinery. So you can either go with the way of keeping the old way and don't invest too much in the new tractors or, uh, but I want to go very progressively. And which as you I want to have you, John Deere tractor, right? We have the John Deere tractors. I we saw have, it. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's, it's the way nice forward, part. right? You have GPS, you know, we, all our tractors today, you don't hold the steering wheel anymore. You, really? you have a guy sitting there, but the fields are mapped out GPS. You, you put on what kind of machine you're pulling. If it's a seed drill or it's a harvester or a combine, and it, yet it don't. Hmm. So we're not where the Americans are yet, where you actually don't have a guy sitting in the tractor. But I'm convinced the time will come, and hmm. I want to be one of the first ones here, without the, 
without the track, the actual, you've seen the tractors, they don't actually have a cabin anymore because the, the farmer is sitting in his office somewhere else driving the tractor. So that, that's not far away, in my opinion. And as I showed you, the we have robots feeding the, the animals for us now. So from a, from a barn where we used to have six employees, we're down to one guy supervising it online where there's two robots really? feeding the cattle, Amazing. spreading the straw. And my opinion is if you want to do farming, that's the only way you're going to be able to do it for the future. You know, this. Very few people want to go into farming today when it comes to manual labor, which I don't blame them. So what do you do? You have to look to improvise and, and look for ways to use the modern technology that's available. So I've got to say that uh, uh, you guided me through your Black Angus um, um, uh, hole, and uh, it looks wonderful. And uh, it's so clean, and, uh, and, and, um, and the animals look uh, like happy. I, I know. Uh, well, they don't know their destiny. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they do. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. But the thing is that I really like this way of uh, some kind of eco, um, uh, you know, eco agriculture, or, uh, eco breeding. That's great. Yeah, no, that's that's been a big part of the, our focus is is so called the welfare of the animal, right? It's, I know, sure, it's one day it ends as a, ends up as a, a product that we all eat, but um, the fact is that the life that they have, they need to be treated in with respect. And the welfare of them is very important to us. So it starts with what you feed them, their housing, how they sleep, you know, are they dry, are they cold? And so that's what we really focused on here is to to make it a, a comfortable place for them. You know, that's, uh, I think we succeeded in it. It's it's one of the, um, it was last year we completed the project and uh, it's proving to work quite well for us. So It's really cool. It's really cool, Matthew. Yeah. Uh, Matthew, you, uh, like we said, like we mentioned already, you have an Austrian wife. Yeah. Who you met in the Austrian Alps, like yeah. your father did and your sister did, <laughs> yeah. which is which is just great. I like it so much. And you have three kids, right? Yeah, you have three kids. Yeah, so uh, two, two uh, girls and a boy. Yeah. Uh, so you are a Canadian uh, guy marrying an Austrian woman, having three kids, living in the Czech Republic. Yeah. Uh, what language do you? Uh, uh, what language do you speak at home? By the way, we we are. Um, it's. Sorry, <laughs> we are speaking a bit of a, a goulash language. <laughs> no, we, we speak, uh, it's funny, we speak, uh, I, I speak English for the kids. So when I'm in the room, we all speak English. Is Veronica speaks perfect English too. So when I leave the room, the kids are with Veronica, they're, they're speaking German. We go out on the farm, we around Czech people, we're speaking Czech. So it's a, it's a real mixture of, uh, of the language. The, the kids are, are, with all three languages, very comfortable now. I see. So it's, uh, so we try and... Um, respect the moment what is there which language to use so uh and and so uh the kids um uh, coped with all with all three languages really well and naturally because i heard that sometimes some kids have problems with uh being in a multicultural or multi-language family so uh, they naturally took all the three languages easily yeah they they really have i mean we 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 uh we intentionally put them into the Czech kindergarten okay. down in Berlin. we have a beautiful small little Catholic school here and um so they they treated them very easy and they knew they were they weren't speaking Czech at home so but when, when the children go to kindergarten they don't know what a language really is right they just know what that's what they speak but they don't know if that's a Czech or whatever language so and it was funny when they came from kindergarten and they would come home and start to play their play language at home was Czech. Uh -huh. That's how they associated with toys. It was, that's how they spoke. They didn't know that they were speaking a different language. It's just, that's how they spoke. And, uh, and then they hear mommy, mommy was mommy's language and daddy's daddy's language. So, um, luckily, and I think they do have some talent and it's not from me. It's more from Veronica's <laughs> side. Um, so they, um, they're, they're learning their fourth language now. They're learning to speak really? French. Yeah. Really? And uh, so they don't have a problem with it. They enjoy it. And so, uh, cool. so they're, they're, they're comfortable. That's so really cool. I, I'm very happy for that because I, for me, it's also very important. That uh, for they, them, it's really cool. For them, it's a, it's a huge advantage to life. Yeah, yeah, for their their future, but also even the fact that they they live here in the Czech Republic, so they they don't know anything different. This is where they were born. This is where they're raised, and so the, the Czech language is something that they need to speak and feel very comfortable with, and they, and they do. So, and by the way, um, you said the roots here. I mean, for good, or, or are you considering moving to Austria or Canada? 
I'm here for good. Yeah. <laughs> if, if nothing other reason why I have. If, if the communists don't come. <laughs> well, I didn't want to say that, but I do have friends who come here and say, Or wow, you've done a. doesn't take your property. <laughs> yeah, no, some friends have come, wow, you've done a good job. That's good for them. They're going to come take it away from you. Exactly. <laughs> They're just waiting for you to finish the last little. So, no, I, I really pray to God, no. So if everything goes as planned, I would like to stay here. And Veronica's happy to stay here and the, the children are at home here. So we, we love it here. I have to say, you know, as a. I am Canadian, um, half Czech, but spending most of my life, the first part of my life in Canada. But I do love living here. You know, I, I, I feel at home. My family feels at home. The, we like the people here. And our life every day, I can speak for myself, but I think I speak for my family. It's, it's, it's challenging, but in the good sense of the way. It's, it's every day something new. And you meet some great people here. So, mm-hmm. and, and the location, it's like uh, to live in the center of Europe. I mean, okay, COVID. One day's gone and we all can go over borders again and to be able to travel the car five hours and be down in the Alps or go to the north somewhere and meet another type of culture. And I, I love it. You yeah. know, it's, I, 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 I just love, uh, you know, having that opportunity. So, yeah, actually, that's what I think the Czech people are not able uh, to appreciate. Um, uh, like, in my opinion, like... Uh, Uh, the Czech Republic for living is a great country. Uh, on the one hand, you have a really high standard of living. And on the other hand, we still kind of keep a certain level of liberty. You know, I think when you go to the United States, like the personal liberty, the personal freedom is much, much worse than in here. Don't you think? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, that's a very, very strong point. What you're saying, I absolutely agree with you on that. And the, uh, the other, uh, what I would just say is for, For me at the beginning, what I found very difficult and I didn't understand why was that there was a really sense of um, pessimistic mentality here. And for me, that was something completely new and still not new, but for me, something that I just don't really understand. And I, I'm one of the big leaders in the way of, I say, listen, just look back when I first came here in 1992, what were we doing? How was it? And what are we doing today? I mean, don't you think it's better? And, you know, so I think the lifestyle that we all live here is something that's, you know, it's, it's on a very high level. And I'm not talking about material, but I'm just talking about the way we're able to live here and, you know, raise our children. And, you know, there's a lot of great things about it, for sure. I agree. So, um, uh, but yeah, you're right. We are kind of studeni chumace. That's for studeni sure. Chumace, studeni yeah. chumace. Always coming back from the West. Uh, you, I'm, I'm so much disappointed with that. Like going to a shop, talking to anybody, everybody is just pissed off, you know? Yeah, uh, and a little there's bit. There's yeah. no reason, you know? But yeah, that's what we checks are. But let's try to change it, Matthew. No, I'm <laughs> trying hard. I, I sometimes just have to laugh, you know? I say, okay. <laughs> It's, it's a, Why? It's, it's a shit day. Okay, <laughs> let's go on. <laughs> But you know what I mean? It's like you have to. You don't get anything from it, you know, when by complaining. So, yeah. you know, so I, I'm. I guess in my own way, I am trying to change it. And you know, I certainly in front of my children, don't want them to let any of that wear off on them that they would start to get. And they certainly aren't right now. So it's. Uh, But I would, I would make a mistake if I didn't mention about the farm. I just realized speaking to my children about our horses because that's a big part of my family here. My wife and the, the reason why I have horses is because of Veronica. Just, I know jumping off topic here, but I just want to make sure because if they watch this one day, they'll say, you didn't talk about our horses. And the horses are really part of their life here. So, how many uh, horses do you have? Uh, shoot. <laughs> 15, I think. 15, 14, 15. 15-ish. Yeah, yeah 15-ish. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, it changes, you know, it changes. But, uh, but that's, uh, it's a hobby. But uh, I just wanted to say that. For the record that I did mention the horses, and I'm very happy we have the horses. And they're a nice addition to the Thank you, Matthew. Matthew, it was uh, just a wonderful discussion with you. It was so, uh, so pleasant. And uh, thank you very much for being with us. Well, uh, thank you. It was a pleasure for me to be with you. So thank you. Thank you.